started while people are still joining us. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, so this is our 20th ECS and Cloud Feedbacks virtual symposium. And uh, so there are, as usual, we have a, a couple of the symposium notes. Um, so this time we have uh, also three AGU style talks and we will have a, a short question and Q&A session after each. Uh, but after all the three questions, we will have a general discussion at the very end. So if you have questions or comments, uh, please type them in the chat. Uh, or if you prefer to ask a question yourself, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, if you would like to give a talk in the future events, please contact us uh, one of the, uh, either one or, or any of the uh, executive committee members listed here. Mm, especially for those who are new, um, we have put all the details, including the recordings and the Q&A in, in our website. And so feel free to uh, go back to check the website. Uh, you will get a lot of more details here. Uh, without further ado, uh, we will welcome our first speaker today, uh, which is Andrew Poning from University of Washington. And I believe he's going to talk about the climate sensitivity. So, take it away, Andrew. Thanks. Um, does that look okay to everyone? Yeah, it looks great. Cool. Uh, yeah, hi. So my name is Andrew. Um, I just recently defended my PhD in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of my PhD research today about uh, whether or not we can constrain uh, climate sensitivity using the response to the Mount Pinatubo eruption. And this is work I've been doing with Cecilia Bitz and Kyle Armour, both here at UW. Um, so the motivation for this work uh, came from a couple of quotes from the most recent IPCC report. Um, so AR6 assessed the best estimate of climate sensitivity between 2.5 and 4 degrees Celsius. Um, and one of the physical constraints that they used uh, for that was the study of Bender et al. 2010. Um, and so that study um, used the response to the Mount Pinatubo eruption to constrain climate sensitivity to between uh, 1.7 and 4.1 degrees C with a best estimate of 2.4. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this constraint was used by AR6 as one of the physical constraints on ECS. Um, they also used the constraint from the Spender et al. paper to constrain TCR to between 0 0.8 and 2.3 degrees Celsius. Um, but the study was quite limited at the time by the small number of models available in CMIP3, which was the, the model uh, into comparison that they were using. And so we wanted to, to revisit this work. and see if we could improve on it using uh, CMIP6. Um, so we're using the response to the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Um, so this uh, volcano is, is located in the Philippines. Um, it erupted famously in June 1991. Um, it's one of the largest eruptions for which we have observations. Um, and it cooled the planet by roughly 0 0.5 degrees C. Um, and the effect of it lasted for a few years after the eruption. Um, and so the method that we're going to use to look at this eruption is making use of model large ensembles. And so in, in CMIP6, uh, many of the modeling groups ran large ensembles for their historical simulations. And so on the right here, I'm showing all of the models in CMIP6 that had at least 10 ensemble members in their historical simulations. Um, and so for each of these, we have the full CMIP6 model standard output available, which makes these really useful for analyzing uh, climate. And so the, the main quantity that this Bender et al. study made use of was a quantity they defined called the volcanic sensitivity. Um, and so on the right here, I'm showing the global mean surface temperature anomaly and the global mean TOA net shortwave anomaly following the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Um, and so each of the colored lines here is one of those uh, large ensembles that I just talked about, the ensemble mean of each of those. And then the black lines are uh, observations. And so uh, they integrated the temperature anomaly for five years following the eruption. Um, they integrated the TOA net shortwave anomaly for two years following eruption. So those are indicated by the gray shading in the plot on the right here. 
and they take the ratio of the two for the volcanic sensitivity. Um, and so uh, it's kind of the, the change in surface temperature that you get per unit change in TOA net shortwave anomaly. And so they first uh, saw if there was a correlation between each of these individual quantities and ECS for the models that they had available at the time. So these figures are both from Bender et al. 2010. Um, on the left here is the integrated shortwave perturbation against ECS, and on the right is the integrated temperature perturbation against ECS. And for neither of those did they find a very strong correlation. Um, and then for the volcanic sensitivity, um, so that using that ratio, they did find a relationship. So they found a good correlation uh, when they looked at the ratio of the temperature anomaly to the TOA net shortwave anomaly. So it seems there was a relationship between uh, volcanic sensitivity and ECS. And so they use this uh, relationship uh, along with the observed values for each of these quantities uh, to form this constraint on ECS to between 1.7 and 4.1 Kelvin per doubling of CO2. But as I mentioned before, um, they were limited by the small amount of model output available. So for CMIT3, they only had nine models that included volcanic forcing, and the total across all nine models was 23 ensemble members, so a relatively small sample size. Um, so now in CMIP6, uh, using those models that I showed before, we have 16 models with at least 10 ensemble members, and in total we have over 500 ensemble members now. So we should be able to get a tighter constraint if this relationship holds. Um, so we made use of this, as well as the recent 100-member um, CESM2 large ensemble, which uses the same uh, forcing and setup as CMIP6. It just wasn't included in the official CMIP6 output, but it's the same, same model. Um, so here, again, I'm showing the, the result from Bender et al. on the bottom right. Um, so this is the relationship between the integrated temperature perturbation and ECS, uh, for which they found no relationship. And on the top here is the same relationship uh, in CMIP6 with each of the colored boxes uh, representing the spread across ensemble members in, in one of those models. And we also find no real relationship. Um, the gray shaded region here is the observed uh, range. Uh, similarly, for the integrated shortwave perturbation alone, uh, Ben Jardal found no real relationship, and neither do we. Um, so those two results seem to match up with what we found. However, for the uh, integrated ratio, um, unlike Bender et al., we don't find a relationship. Um, so I should note the sign is flipped here because we've defined the uh, TOA net shortwave anomaly, the opposite sign convention to what they did. Um, but we don't find the same uh, relationship that they did between volcanic sensitivity and ECS with this much greater quantity of model output. Um, similarly, for TCR, uh, for none of the three quantities did we find a relationship uh, between the integrated relationship, uh, integrated rate, uh, quantity and TCR. So um, they did find this uh, a relationship and used it to form a constraint, um, but we, we didn't find any clear relationship for either integrated temperature, shortwave, or the ratio of the two. So what's going on here? Uh, why, why is there this mismatch? Um, so we found that the correlation found by Bender et al. 2010 is consistent with statistical chance. And so uh, from our over 500 ensemble members in CMIP6, I took a random sample of 23 from nine models, which is what Bender et al. had available at the time, and then computed uh, the ratio, volcanic sensitivity ratio and the correlation, and repeated this 10,000 times. And the PDF on the right here is the result of that. Uh, the vertical black dashed line is the slope found by Bender et al. So you can see that it falls within the ensemble. So uh, there's a pretty high chance that they could have just found this, uh, this correlation purely by luck. Um, so it seems with that much smaller amount of model uh, output available at the time, they were underestimating the, the internal variability in these quantities. Um, so then I wanted to ask whether we should expect a correlation in the first place. Um, and so to investigate this, I used the two-layer model of HELD et al. 2010, um, which has been used to develop understanding of the climate system, and it's designed to emulate the temperature evolution of a fully coupled GCM with just two equations. Um, so one for a shallow mixed layer and one for the deep ocean. And so the, the uh, rate of change of temperature multiplied by the heat capacity for each layer um, for the shallow layer is given by the sum of the forcing, the feedback, and an ocean heat uptake uh, 
parameterization uh, given by gamma times the temperature difference. And for the deep ocean, uh, it, it takes up that heat from the shallow layer. And so I fit the parameters uh, uh, to the climate model output from abrupt four times CO2 simulations for each of the CMIP6 models that I had available. Um, so I fit Lambda using the, the Gregory method. Uh, sorry, that says described earlier because I took the slide from another talk, but I, I assume this audience is familiar with that method. Um, and then I fit the other parameters of the model using the procedure outlined in Jeff Roy et al. Uh, 2013. And so for each of the CMIP6 models that I had, I fit these parameters um, and then ran the model first with uh, to see if how well it reproduced the abrupt four times CO2 uh, response. So here I'm showing the global mean surface temperature response to abrupt four times CO2 uh, from the CMIP6 model in blue and from the two layer model in orange. And you can see it, it does really well at reproducing that response. So we're confident that the model uh, can, can reproduce that. Um, so you're then using the parameters fit from that uh, and using an estimate of the observed um, volcanic forcing from Pinatubo from Schmidt et al. 2018. I ran the two layer model using the parameters from each of the CMIP6 models and computed the quantities that we analyzed in the CMIP models. So on the top here is the shallow and deep layer temperature response after Pinatubo from each from the two layer model fit with the parameters from each of the um, individual CMIP6 models. And then on the bottom, I'm showing the correlation between uh, the integrated temperature response in the shallow layer and ECS for each model. And so the key assumption here is that the feedbacks are the same uh, as they are for abrupt four times CO2 uh, to, in response to the volcano. Um, and so the fact that there is a correlation here suggests that if the feedbacks um, in response to CO2 are the same for uh, response to a volcano, then we should have expected to see a correlation in CMIP6. Uh, similarly, for the integrated shortwave anomaly on the top left and the integrated volcanic sensitivity on the bottom left, um, we do find uh, a reasonable correlation uh, between ECS and the integrated quantities produced by the two-layer model. And so again, that suggests that if the feedbacks in response to CO2 were the same as in response to the volcano, uh, then we should have expected to see a correlation uh, in CMIP6. And so the fact that we don't suggest that there is some underlying difference in the feedbacks in response to a volcano as compared to CO2. And so going back to the quantities that I showed at the start, um, here the black dashed line is showing the relationship that I found using the two-layer model um, overlaid on the CMIP models. And you can see that those relationships don't really hold up very well. Um, so that indicates that the feed, there must be some difference in the feedbacks to the volcanic eruption that's causing this difference. Um, so in summary, um, the response to Mount Pinatubo does not constrain ECS very well in CMIP6. Um, the previous result using CMIP3 output is consistent with statistical chance. And uh, the results here suggest that if the feedbacks to a volcanic eruption were the same as those to increase CO2, we should have expected a relationship. Um, thank you. Awesome, thanks. That's a really uh, clear talk. Uh, are there any questions? Um, uh, Thurston asks, um, I, I had this question as well. Did you use, um, did you include the ocean heat uptake efficacy in the two layer model? And if not, uh, why did you choose to ignore it? Um, we, I did, I didn't show it here. Um, we did it with and without the ocean heat uptake efficacy. Um, it didn't really change the, um, the response. So I, I left it out here uh, for simplicity, but including it didn't really change the there was, there was still um, there was still a correlation uh, with the ocean heat uptake efficacy. Yeah, okay. um, I should say it did it did make the two layer model values of the volcanic sensitivity line up a little better with the CMIP models, but it didn't change the overall correlation. Okay, and then uh, maybe Karsten, can you unmute? Yep, real quick. Um, I thought this Enzo issue is playing a role here. And people have looked into it and then came to different conclusions as to what the response might be. I wonder how far you try to use that as a constraint. <clears throat> Perhaps some of these uh, approaches where you fix the SST or something, or pick just those models who have a certain answer response. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I guess in this 
in these results, we assumed that given that our ensembles are fairly large, that we were averaging out ENSO. Um, I haven't tried just picking models that were in a phase of, or ensemble members that were in a phase of either El Nino or La Nina, but yeah, that would be interesting to look at. I, I haven't dug into that. Okay, and Tim, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Hi there, thanks. Um, so last time I checked on like the observational estimates of Pinatubo volcanic forcing, there are pretty large discrepancies between uh, data sets that people are using. And it seemed plausible to me that like in CMIP3, CMIP5 era, different modeling centers made different choices for what aerosol optical depths they were prescribing. Um, your two box model analysis just prescribes, you know, one data set, which is of course reasonable, but are, how confident are you that the different CMIP6 models really have the same sort of volcanic forcing? And I don't know if there's like interactive aerosol uh, in the stratosphere in some models. So thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that is definitely an issue for CMIP3 and CMIP5 that uh, different modeling centers are kind of left up to their own devices for what they use for volcanic forcing. Um, for CMIP6, they, they were uh, prescribed to use the same volcanic forcing uh, aeros aerosol optical depth. Um, so they should be pretty close to each other in terms of forcing. Um, but yeah, for, for the older models, that's definitely not the case. Thanks. Awesome, thanks. I think we should move on to the next talk, but uh, Andrew, please monitor the chat because um, I think there's more questions coming in. Thanks. Yeah, that was some nice talk, Andrew. Um, so the next speaker today is the Perchua Selvi from Imperial College, and he's going to talk about the time evolving radiative feedbacks in the historical period. Mm, Perchua, if you're ready, yeah, feel free to share your screen. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Oh, okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next speaker. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm similar boat as uh, as before. Uh, I'm also a PhD. Well, I'm just finished off my PhD. or defended it successfully uh, with minor revisions. Uh, now I'm working at the University of Reading with Jonathan Gregory, and I'm still a little bit with Paolo, but he's still at Imperial. Um, and today I'm just going to talk about uh, certain things. And to start off with a very boring thing that I think everyone's seen the death to death is this this equation. But I'm showing it for a good reason, namely to show the uh, the convention that I'm using. So, you know, we've, we're used to this energy imbalance N is equal to this forcing F minus this alpha feedback parameter times the uh, change in global average surface temperature at T. Uh, but I just want to clarify that I'm using the response uh, as alpha times delta T, uh, where I've got this positive alpha. Uh, so uh, just highlighting that this positive upwards response R, uh, where alpha, a larger alpha values suggest that you've got uh, less temperature change per unit forcing, uh, whereas smaller uh alpha values smaller positive alpha values suggest uh, more temperature change by unit forcing now something i'm going to talk about a lot is stability and i'm going to talk about what i mean by that uh, tropospheric stability generally but the measure i actually use is estimated inversion strength which is probably better described uh, more recognizable uh, as a correction to low tropospheric stability which is just the simple gradient of uh potential temperatures at 700 hectopascals versus at the surface uh, and EIS just includes a correction to account for moist adiabatic convection within clouds. Um, and one thing I want to uh, say is I'll talk about global average values, but for EA, for stability, I'm generally not actually using global values, uh, but instead this near global value from 50 south to 50 north, um, just because it's correlated better with uh, observations and uh, models uh, in terms of describing the, the radiative response. Um, uh, just because it avoids a significant, uh, very large stability changes that happen at high latitudes over icy regions that aren't really related to to cloud changes and uh, cloud formation changes, which is what we, which is how we understand stability changes and how they affect the response mainly, is how they encourage uh, low cloud formation and increased reflectivity, so increased response uh, as you increase stability change, uh, as you increase stability. Now the motivation behind this work that I've done, uh, looking at feedbacks over time, is another work that I looked at feedbacks over time, Jonathan. Gregory did this with a few other people back in 2020. And what's showing here is the feedback parameter alpha uh, using uh, done calculated with 30 year sliding regressions over uh, over the historical period, over the 18, uh, 1860 period to 2000. 
And uh, what they found using CMIP5 data here is that the uh, you get significant variations in feedbacks for historical greenhouse gas, for historical natural forcing, and the all historical forcings. Uh, and a lot of a lot of the variations in this whole historical forcings in black here can be described by the uh, different contributions from greenhouse gas and natural forcings. Now, something we can do with CMIP6 data is we've got these PI Klim experiments, which let us actually diagnose the forcing over time. Uh, and remove those adjustments from these so we can actually get the response itself. Uh, but I didn't just want to look at this and remake this figure better. Uh, I actually wanted to get a nice mechanistic understanding of what was happening here and what was driving these stability changes. Uh, and to do that, we tried looking at a stability perspective to try and understand how things were evolving over time. So the first thing, first result I'll show is this, where I'm, all I'm showing here is the in different for different colors. I've got different. Uh, forcing experiments, uh, different historical forcings. Uh, and I've got this feedback parameter alpha uh, against the stability change per unit surface temperature change uh, on the x-axis. Uh, and what I'm uh, everything here is relative to greenhouse gas. So, But what I'm trying to show here is that uh, for larger values of alpha, uh, you get less warming per unit uh, forcing, whereas for smaller values of alpha, you get um, more temperature change per unit forcing. And that's correlated well with the stability changes we see. And this has been done using seven models, not, not a huge selection of models, but it's what we had the what we could get the PI climate experiments for. Uh, and these regressions are just done over the whole period, 1850 to 2004, uh, 2015. Um, what we actually see from this for uh, historical aerosols in blue here is we see a lower feedback parameter compared to greenhouse gas, which means more amplifying feedbacks, so more temperature change per unit surface uh, per unit forcing uh, under aerosol forcing than for greenhouse gas forcing. Whereas for vol uh, volcanic aerosols, for, for, natural, uh, for the natural experiment, uh, we see significantly larger uh, feedbacks, which means significantly less uh, temperature change per unit forcing. And just to clarify, I'm not going to show this here but uh, because of time. But if we use kernels, we do uh, reconfirm that uh, all of this relationship is because of shortwave cloud uh, feedbacks, which just reconfirms what we expect to understand. Uh, and our understanding of how stability might affect uh, the rate of response uh, for different forcing agents. So uh, why, why do we actually get those different stability changes, which drive those different uh, rate of feedbacks? Uh, one thing I want to focus on uh, in terms of different forcing agents is forcing patterns, uh, is how we've, we've chosen to describe what may be, what may be happening here. Uh, and what I'd like to focus on for now is just panel A here, which is showing the uh, normalized between experiments between the average forcing they have, but the top of atmosphere forcing you get um, is only average between them. And you can see here in, in orange, we've got this greenhouse gas forcing, uh, which is generally very uniform uh, across latitudes, uh, whereas you can compare it to something like historical aerosol forcing, which, is, which shows this very big northern hemisphere extratropical skew. And that is actually how we've described uh, why we get less stability change per unit warming under aerosols compared to greenhouse gas is because of this extra tropical skew, which uh, we found drives a lot of uh, shallow warming in the northern hemisphere extratropics per unit surface temperature change, um, which explains, uh, which destabilizes things in that region per unit surface warming, uh, which explains why you get the, the uh, lower feedbacks for aerosol and greenhouse gas. But for volcanic forcing, hopefully you can see in pink here, there's not really that much of an extra tropical versus tropical skew. There may be a little bit of a tropical focus, but but it's, it's not like there's no fo uh, forcing in the uh, northern hemisphere extratropics or the southern hemisphere extratropics. Um, but what we do see, which we, which we really want to explain, if we move into uh, tropical, uh, if we move into temperature space, and we focus entirely on the tropics, uh, in panel E, what we can see here is that the temperature change and the 30% warmest SSTs in the tropics, i.e. the warm pool, which is related to stability changes, quite uh, very important for stability changes. Uh, we see a lot more warming in the warm pool under volcanic forcing than we do outside of the warm pool. And that's not something we see for the other experiments. In terms of how we actually uh, explain what's happening here, uh, taking a forcing uh, pattern, uh, trying to explain this through forcing patterns, one thing we, we found is that uh, looking again at tropical um, at looking again at temperature space in the tropics, we see that the forcing in panel C uh, is a lot higher over the warm pool in volcanic forcing uh, than it is outside of the warm pool, uh, which isn't replicated in other experiments. And you may be thinking, okay, well, top of atmosphere forcing isn't directly related to its surface temperature change, and there's a bit of a 
the disconnect there. So we also show the surface forcing here and see we still see this uh, increased forcing at the surface in the warm pool for volcanic forcing than outside the warm pool. Um, but we do see the same thing for, for aerosol forcing as well, but aerosol forcing is possibly dominated by uh, by the extra tropical skew. So this warm pool, extra warm pool forcing under aerosol forcing in the warm pool possibly isn't that important. Uh, alternatively, this is also just one explanation that we have of this, uh, and there may be other effects that come into play, such as time scales of forcing that you get for volcanic forcing, which affect this. So I did say I'd talk about things over time, and this is this is it. This is the evolution over time that I'm showing here. So in the top row, I've got these this feedback parameter evolving over time for these different forcing experiments, and these different historical forcings. Uh, and in the bottom row, what I'm showing is the stability change per unit surface temperature change, uh, similarly calculated through 30 year regressions over time. And hopefully, something I can uh, you can see looking at this one by one for historical aerosol, for example, we see very good correlation between these feedbacks changes this feedback evolution and these stability changes over time. Um, you may, uh, we see the same, we see very good correlation again for the historical experiment and for, as well for MPI forcing. Um, and you might say uh, there are two cases where you don't see good correlation, but actually uh, I'd argue that's, that's not really uh, that important because for greenhouse gas, for example, the lack of correlation is probably coming from a lack of evolution in greenhouse gas feedbacks over time uh, relative to what you see in other experiments. And for the natural case, uh, what I'm showing here in gray bars is the volcanic forcing years with significant volcanic forcing. And the only time there's not a good correlation is actually in this middle period where we're missing volcanic forcing. Uh, so it might just be a force signal and a lack of a lack of uh, or a signal to noise ratio um, that we're seeing there. So uh, what we can do with this is then try and understand what we can look at these different uh, evolutions of feedbacks for aerosol greenhouse gas and natural forcing and try and understand what's happening in this historical case, uh, which is what we've done. We can do that by breaking things down into an early period, which is dominated by volcanic forcing. And you can see that it matches very well between these green lines. This green line and this, purple, this pink line match up very well in this early period because the historical case is largely just dominated by volcanic forcing early on. We then have this middle period, which is a combination of aerosols and greenhouse gases, but is largely uh, missing volcanic forcing. Uh, and this, uh, I maybe don't have time to go into it now, but this evolution here um, does line up reasonably well with uh, the sort of constant feedbacks that we get for greenhouse gas and this change that we see here for aerosols. Uh, and then we can talk about a late period, which is a combination of all three uh, forcings of aerosol, greenhouse gas, and volcanic forcing, uh, which results in the feedbacks in the later period being more or less just the same as greenhouse gas forcings as aerosol and, and volcanic forcing sort of cancel each other out, um, one being larger and one being smaller than, than greenhouse gas forcing. Uh, the feedbacks were, with the feedbacks being uh, relative, yeah, with volcanic feedbacks being greater and aerosol feedbacks being less than greenhouse gas forcing, when you put them together, um, they, they contribute towards something that's similar to greenhouse gas forcing. Um, a little extra small result from this is just a reconfirmation of how uh, Either models are getting aim, uh, getting historical SSTs wrong, or aim up, the aim of data sets a little bit odd, a bit of a historical quirk, uh, since the aim of PI forcing evolution of feedbacks just doesn't really agree with the uh, historical experiment evolution of feedbacks. So to quickly finish this off, uh, we do find a we find this agent dependence on feedbacks over the, looking at the whole period from 1850 to 2015 using this historical experiments, which is something that is, is a nice confirmation again of something we've seen where, where feedbacks aren't necessarily consistent between forcing agents. And we can explain differences between forcing agents quite nicely by looking at stability differences uh, related to shortwave cloud uh, responses. Uh, we can explain aerosol uh, feedbacks being less amplifying, uh, so uh, uh, being more amplifying, sorry, this is the typo, being more amplifying than greenhouse gas forcing, uh, so more temperature change per unit forcing driven by the extra tropical skew, whereas and this is the other way around again. So volcanic forcing being uh, a less amplifying than greenhouse gas forcing because of significant warm pool forcing, which means high stability changes. So you get more of a response per unit forcing. Um, and we can also look at historical evolution, the historical evolution of feedbacks uh, and both use stability to understand what's happening and the evolution there uh, mechanistically, and also look at different forcing, um, forcing agents and put them together to have a general understanding of what has happened in the historical context. Thank you. Awesome, really interesting stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Can I check if there's any questions? Um, maybe I'll start with a kind of clarification question. Um, I might have gotten confused here, but it seemed like the um, uh, when you plot the aerosol force, the aerosol feedback, it was uh, destabilizing um, when you compare. Yeah. But then in the time series, um, it was always stabilizing. Is that right? So yeah, so that uh, uh, another type of finding typos which were in my thesis as well. So I should be a little bit more right about this. But uh, this is all relative to greenhouse gas in this figure. Sorry. Oh, Apologies sorry, I missed that. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Uh, but this is all relative to greenhouse gas. So, um, like you like you pointed out, the stability changes for aerosol are generally positive as well. Um, but they're just less positive on average than greenhouse gas stability changes. Um, Okay, got it. Yeah, the extra trop. If we if we took the extra tropical the extra tropical forcing of aerosol by itself, it would probably have a destabilizing effect overall. Um, but aerosol forcing, of course, still has that tropical tropical aspect of forcing, um, which increases, which contributes towards a positive stability change. Just overall, it's less positive than. than yeah, I was wondering aspects. if you could say more about th how the stability changes affect. Um, feedback in the extra tropics because when I think of the importance of stability it has to do with mm -hmm. the subtropical low cloud decks so what do you think is going on at higher latitudes yeah uh so so it's not amazingly clear what's happening I'm still looking into this in terms of trying to understand the sort of kernel decomposition of what's what's happening there it still seems to be related to to shortwave cloud effects so it, it would be my understanding that it's still related to to low cloud formation, um, but it's also possible that there are other things. Well, no, there definitely are other things that are play. It's just it still seems to be dominated by shortwave cloud. So, um, so it, it seems like this still still has an impact. I mean, it, it's you know it, you have it looks like you have to get quite a large uh, extra tropical skew to see even a small stability change, like you see for aerosol. So. So it might still be small effects that have a very strong, like that very strong skew still only makes very small effects, um, like you see here. Uh, it's, it's you know, the stability, de uh, the, the difference between stability change for aerosol compared to greenhouse gas is quite small compared to what we get for volcanic forcing, um, even for a small, small differences. So that, the warm pool warming seems like it's a much, much, um, try to say this, easier way of changing stability. Um, than than by this extra tropical skew. Like you need a large extra tropical skew to get the same stability change. Um, so we might not expect very large, very much to come from uh, low extra tropical clouds, but but maybe there's still still something happening there. Well, there must be. Okay, great. Um, wait, does someone have their hands up? Moritz. Yeah, Moritz. We have time for a question. Uh, pretty cool and very convincing. Um, the only thing I'm not so convinced of is that you said that the warm pool temperature change mostly comes from the fact that the aerosols are also mostly forcing the warm pool. Mm -hmm. And I, I have simulations with um, volcanic eruptions that happen in the extra tropics, and they actually show, show yeah. the same thing happening. And I yeah. even see this, this might very well be model dependent, but I even see the same thing happening when you cool from, from the reductions in CO2 concentration. So I'm just yeah. thinking yeah. that there might also be other causes than just the yeah, fact of that... Course. Of course, is, is this uh, this is something that we've we've found and we've we've seen that it's very hard to um, get much more out of this. I mean, clearly, it's not it's not a it's not the be all and end all here. Um, something I'm I am I am now looking at whether things are related to the time scales based off of. Uh, so I'm looking at abrupt simulations. I'm looking at uh, some of the Volmip ex Volmip experiments to try and see if if this kind of behavior still happens regardless of, of your forcing just because of the abruptness of the forcing or short time scales of forcing. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't really apply in your case, uh, looking at the cooling, right? You've got the, the, you're saying the cooling experiments in CO2 also give you something like this, yeah. um, which isn't, uh, which isn't really abrupt, right? It's, well, it's, it's abrupt, but there's no more abrupt than a doubling of CO2. Um, so that there may be, or be other things. I mean, non-linearities as well. Um, but hopefully because I've taken an, a multimodal mean the nonlinearities aren't too much of a problem, though I'm sure they still are. I know they appear in, I know they, they can be quite strong for any given model, but I haven't seen a huge, huge nonlinearity 
uh, cross models. Okay, great. I think we should move on, but uh, Pietro, please keep an eye on the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice talk. Uh, thanks for the great talk of Pietro. Uh, so this third talk, also the last talk today, is uh, gonna from Feng Li from NASA, and uh, we're gonna hear from him about the stratospheric water vapor under global warming. Take it away. Thanks. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, good afternoon from Maryland. Um, my name is Feng Li. Uh, I'm from UNPC at the NASA Goddard. So today I'm going to talk about um, uh, stratospheric water vapor feedback. Uh, this, this work is done by my co-author, Paul Newman, uh, from NASA Goddard. Okay. So uh, in the stratospheric community, there is a strong interest to understand how uh, SWV changes in the warming climate and how these changes can affect climate. Uh, this is interest is um, motivated by observed uh, SWV changes in the past three, four decades, particularly the unexpected uh, large increase of water vapor over Boulder. So here um, in this panel, uh, I show the time series of the Boulder measurements in the North Chester over Boulder. Uh, the different colors uh, means different attitude. Um, they say that water vapor increases in the 1980s and the 1990s, then there's a big drop 2000 and it kind of recovers after 2005. So overall in this uh, 30 year period, the measurements show about 25% increase. However, this uh, large increase is not confirmed by satellite observations uh, on a global scale. But the uh, satellite observations do show a positive trend since uh, year 2000 um, as shown in this um, study. So those observations, have motivated uh, many studies on the possible impact of SWV producing on climate. So on, here on the left, I show a study, an early study, um, which uh, in, investigated the impact of 10% increase of SWV, uniform increase on temperature. So we know that uh, water vapor is a strong uh, long wave emitter. So an increase in stratospheric water vapor will cool the stratosphere but warm the uh, troposphere on the surface. In this study, they found a 10% increase in SWV uh, leads to cooling of stratosphere by about 0.3, mostly, but uh, warm, warm the troposphere and surface by 0 0.1, 0 0.2 Ks. Um, Solomon at all 2010 uh, investigated uh, the big drop of uh, SWV at 2000 on the decadal, decadal surface warming rate. Uh, what they found uh, here is that this 10% drop of SWV at two year 2000 actually decreased the uh, decade roaming rate by about 25% in, uh, in 2000s. However, uh, in, their study, in their study, when they uh, consider, when they consider um, water vapor increase in the 1980s and 1990s uh, derived from uh, the Buddha measurements, they found that uh, the decade warming rate in these three decades increased by 30%. So those studies suggest that uh, stress for water vapor could or may have already um, significantly influenced the uh, global warming. Um, but a question is, um, okay. But the question is, uh, are these uh, stress for water vapor productions, should we consider it as, um, Due to forcing or climate feedback, uh, so this uh, depends on what causes the increase of the SWV. Uh, we know that water vapor enters the stratosphere mostly uh, in the troposphere, uh, in the tropics, and as the amount intermediate stratosphere is largely dependent on the tropic cold point, tropical temperature. So, if the uh, water vapor increase in stratosphere is caused by uh, enhanced Tropical to host temperature from rising CO2, as uh, in this is um, generally regarded as a feedback. But there are other processes that can increase the uh, SWV. For example, methane oxidation is an important source of water vapor in the middle and upper stratosphere. If uh, methane increase, increases, it can increase uh, stress water vapor. 
uh, uh, enhanced broad-up circulation can accelerate the uh, mass circulation uh, leading to increased sensitivity. And also volcanic eruptions, for example, the hunger tank eruption is injected about uh, 140 teragram of water vapor, about 10% of a stressful uh, water vapor loading into the stressful. Uh, these processes are regarded as forcing that uh, climate feedback. So uh, um, the strength of the uh, stressful water vapor feedback is not uh, certain. There is a uh, a uh, large uncertainty. Uh, in the latest FCC report, it is assessed as 0.05 uh, watt per square meter per K with large uncertainties. So here I list uh, some relevant studies. Uh, you can see there's a, a wider range from the order of magnitude differences. Um, and you may notice that uh, um, uh, the value produced by the so-called fixed dynamic heating method as a larger values than other method. Uh, interesting, uh, Huang et al. 2020 and Lin Newman 2020, they used a similar method, also with different names, but they produce uh, very different results. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the work by uh, Lin Newman. So in order to um, quantify the SWV feedback, we have conducted a so-called feedback suppressing experiment. Uh, the model we use is uh, NASA Goddard uh, Juice CCM, uh, as it's a coupled uh, GCM. So, the idea is simple. We perform two uh, potential experiments. So, one, a control is with um, SWV feedback, but as in, in a, we call a fixed SWV simulation, we suppress uh, the SWV feedback. So, the difference uh, from different, we can uh, quantify the feedback of a uh, stress speaker water vapor. I should mention that uh, JUICE is, does not uh, participate in CMIP and the photo experiment we conducted is a lot of thick experiment. So the baseline is actually under fixed year 2004 since. Uh, I also should note that we didn't use uh, interactive chemistry. So we don't have, uh, the messing spacing is not included in this experiment. This schematic uh, illustrates how we do the um, uh, water we have, sorry, water per suppression. So in both the one, so in both the one time CO two and the four time CO two simulations, uh, water vapor in stressful is relaxed to a uh, prescribed kinematic voltage. Uh, but we de but we design a um, transition layer just about to propose. This transition layer is uh, 50, 50 kilopascal deep, and so above the transition layer, uh, the relaxing time is three days. And when the transition measure relax time increases from the top to bottom to bottom. So uh, and generally we have two mobile levels within this transition layer. So this approach we ensure that uh, the water vapor is gradually translates from a model character value as proposed to a price scrubber value in the lower stratosphere. And you can also uh, see from here that our master does not completely uh, remove uh, water vapor increase uh, uh, in the photon CO2 experiments uh, with the um, fixed SWV. Okay, let's first look at the uh, changes in water vapor. Uh, I here only show the stress for water vapor changes. So in the control simulation, we can uh, water vapor increases uh, throughout the stress sphere. In the overworld, uh, which is uh, defined as uh, between 100 and 1 hectopascal, uh, the increase is pretty uniform with about, about three to four ppm. Uh, in the lower most stratosphere, which you define here is between two poles and 100 hectopascal, say uh, large increases with strong vertical gradient. Uh, in the fixed test of experiment, by design, there's no uh, changes in the overworld, but in the uh, lower most stratosphere, uh, all reverse still increases, um, but it's much suppressed compared to the control run. It's only about a 40% to that uh, in the control simulations. And here in the right panel, we show the difference between control and the fixed SWV. And so in this overall uh, average, we have a 3.6 ppm increase in water vapor. And in the normal sphere, there is about four ppm increases. Okay. Now let's see its impact on um, global warming. So this is a major results of uh, our study and here we compare the uh, 
global anemone surface temperature or normalize uh, in these two experiments. Black, I, black is control, red is fixed SWV. So these two start to diverge about 10 years, after 10 years. And at the end of this 150 year run, we see that the difference is about half K, about 10%. So in Joe's, um, uh, SWV feedback is important to amplify the global mean by 10%. So we can quantify the feedback parameter using gray gray regression, and we found in the control, the total feedback is minus one, uh, it's minus 1.11 for fixed SWV, so therefore, so uh, the SWV feedback in juice is 0 0.11 watt per square meter per K. So this number um, is smaller than those produced by the fixed dynamic heating method, but it's not, not much larger than those, um, uh, for example, um, by Huang Tao 2020. Uh, I should mention uh, this number should be regarded as the lower limit of the um, historical feedback in joules because uh, uh, because in our method, as I mentioned before, that we underestimated um, the lower stratosphere, normal stratosphere, uh, one of the per increase. Okay, so we can uh, further uh, compare uh, what temperature changes due to historical uh, feedback and uh, due to the uh, bottom CO2. Um, so here is a control stabilizing the temperature change in the um, due to photon CO2. This is due to uh, stable feedback. In the troposphere, we see that uh, the, the pattern is pretty uh, similar. Uh, we see that SW feedback uh, leads to enhanced warming in the tropical upper troposphere and in the Arctic surface, low, low, low troposphere. Um, but in the stratosphere, um, um, the temperature change uh, has in general, it's cooling, but there are few patterns of uh, um, patterns of enhanced cooling uh, in the tropics, but uh, reduced the cooling and the ex-tropics. This, this uh, suggests that um, uh, SWV increase can uh, significantly change the stressor dynamics. So uh, this is indeed uh, confirmed if we compare the changes of um, dynamic heating rate um, by increase in uh, stress for water vapor. So here it shows that um, we find that uh, uh, the increase in stress for water vapor leads to anomalously dynamic cooling in the, uh, in the tropics and anomalous uh, dynamic warming in the ectropics indicating uh, acceleration of the broad down circulation with stronger upwelling in the tropics and stronger downwelling uh, in the ectropics. And we can further um, uh, quantify uh, its impact on broad atmospheric uh, circulation. Um, so here we compare the um, time series of the um, upward mass flux at 70 hectopascal, which is a common diagnostic for the strength of the broad atmospheric circulation. We see that um, and the control run has major increase, and uh, we can conclude that um, increase of the stress for oil vapor contributed to about nearly 30% of uh, product secretion acceleration. Yeah. Okay, so um, I've shown that um, uh, that this SWO feedback uh, uh, amplified global warming by 10%, um, but this warming has large latitudinal origins. So here or is a, a ratio of normal mean surface temperature warming due to SWO feedback uh, to that due to bottom CO2. And you can see there's uh, clearly um, hemispherical symmetries and in the Arctic, uh, SW feedback contributed to 40% of um, surface warming, um, which is much larger than 10, the global mean term, 10% uh, change. Therefore, uh, we can conclude that SW feedback actually plays a role in Arctic amplification. All right, so this is last, my last slide. So we look at the impact of um, increase of uh, stratosphere water vapor on you know, minimal range. Uh, in the stratosphere, last uh, impact is in uh, mid latitudes and the subtropics with uh, stronger moisturized. In the troposphere, we see that it actually um, leads to a, um, a stronger power shift of the northern hemisphere tropospheric jet. This can be more clear to see if we compare the 500 hectopascal lunar wind response for time CO2, black line is control run, uh, red line is fixed SWV run. We see that 
with increase of a stressful water repair leads to a stronger power shift of the energy jet in the bottom hemisphere. Okay, so here uh, I come to my conclusion. Uh, I think the typical message is, is that uh, in our model, in JOST, um, stress your water with your feedback is important. Uh, it amplifies warming by 10%. Uh, it can cause significant changes in stress for dynamics. Uh, they also um, play a role or in active amplification and uh, can affect uh, uh, stressful jet uh, power water shift. So I, this is my citation, my paper. Okay, thanks for your attention. Great, thanks for the talk. Um, give everyone a moment to think of questions. Um, uh so I have a question. I have a question. Um, so can you explain, do you have a good explanation for why uh, the answer you're getting is quite a bit larger than what mm -hmm. Yuan got in his analysis? Because I think you guys are doing basically the same thing. Yeah. We actually, we have, uh, I discussed with uh, Yi Huang, um, um, we, we have, uh, he has done some analysis of um, my uh, results and uh, we do see some compensation of um, what he proposed uh, uh, from tropospheric temperature and the cloud uh, feedbacks. But, but the thing is, I think in his analysis, it requires um, uh, a relative uh, equilibrium, but we, as you can see, we have wrong lunch in our, uh, because there's a four, four couple of model. Uh, in 150 years, it's, it's not in uh, equilibrium. This is one concern. Um, um, also, I think, uh, yeah, so we don't have a conclusive uh, answer for this, but uh, it also could be um, model differences. Uh, we use a um, full, fully coupled GCM and he use a side model. Our model is, uh, has a well-resolved uh, stressor. It's a model top in the atmosphere. And he used, uh, I think it's a low top model. And uh, yeah, I think yeah, we don't have a good answer for why it's so different. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, please keep thinking of questions for Fang, but I wanna ask, uh, I want to raise a question which Isaac and Thorsten have um, put in the chat concerning the first two talks. So in Andrew's talk, it seemed like um, there was no clear signal in um, uh, the volcanic sensitivity and how that relates to uh, models as climate sensitivity. Uh, but in the second talk, there was um, a well-defined efficacy for volcanic forcing from the historical simulations. Um, so maybe Andrew, if you wanted to give a first shot at addressing this. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think if I understand right, um, we found that there's no correlation between the models. Um, yeah, a, a no correlation between the, the volcanic sensitivity and ECS across models. Um, I think that's slightly different to just there being a, a difference in the like multi, I guess the the multi-model mean. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure I understand fully. Uh, Isaac, maybe uh, do you want to uh, unmute and and uh, so repeat the question or clarify? I'm not sure I understand it. And maybe I missed the second talk went by a little quickly. But is the implication from the second talk that there is a connection between the volcanic sensitivity and the uh, climate sensitivity, which I think is just an efficacy of volcanic forcing? Uh, maybe I'm just confused. No. Pietro? Um, so 
yeah, I'm, I'm, st I'm still not 100 sure uh, of the discussion, but um, yeah, I can, I can say whether the differences are big or where the exactly differences are coming from, if they are there. But uh, yeah, I think what what I did find was that the well, if we're if, sorry, if we're if we're talking about climate sensitivity in terms of doubling of CO two, then that's not related to the uh, to the to the volcanic forcing that I found or the volcanic feedbacks that I found. Um, it's just the yeah, it's just the. the I want to be very specific that I'm talking about short-term feedbacks as well, because I'm looking at very short-term. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I want to be very specific in what I'm talking about is the short-term short-term feedbacks from volcanic forcing, because we don't we don't look at uh, volcanic forcing going towards equilibrium in what I've done. I only look at um, the feedback while volcanic forcing is active as well. So that that's also a slightly different thing. So. It, what I've what I've said is that the feedbacks as volcanic forcing are applied in the historical feedback in historical simulations are very large, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they um, give uh, a lower efficacy at equilibrium because they're still subject to pattern effects and all that, as time, and time evolving feedbacks um, and many other effects. Does that help? I'm not, I see a lot of talking in the chat. Yeah, I, I like Jonah's point. Um, I know he's feeling a little unwell. Jonah, uh, do you want to unmute? Yeah, or I can um, unmute it if you're not feeling well. I, I was just saying maybe part of this is that, uh, I mean, I, I I think maybe part of what Isaac was saying has to do with the the fact that if, you know, Pietro's finding that there's a connection between the strength of uh, the response to volcanic forcing and the and the strength of the feedback associated with the warm pool region, uh and maybe uh part of part of the difference with you know if if there's a lot of variation in the feedbacks in other regions then you wouldn't necessarily expect there to be a correlation between the um you know, there might not be a correlation between the strength of the feedback in the warm pool region and feedback and feedbacks elsewhere in the first place and so if the, the response to volcanic forcing and the response to a broader forcing might be, uh, yeah, not not so correlated. That, that that's all. This this is hopefully stuff that that some stuff like GFMIP will help uh, sort out because we'll get to see this directly between models. Yeah, I had the same thought. Um, okay, we're coming up on the hour, and people are starting to drop off. Are there any last questions, especially for Fang? Um, if not, uh, thanks again to all our speakers. And again, please get in touch if you want to give a talk. Uh, we're always looking for speakers. And, um, yeah, uh, otherwise, see everyone next month, hopefully. Thanks, everyone.